Welcome to the Jeff Crilly Show. I am your host, Jeff Crilly, and I am thrilled to have a friend who's uh, been in my life for several years now, uh, Ken Jenkins. He's an aviation consultant, and he is a uh, much sought after author and speaker, author of the book Resilience Stories of Courage and Survival in Aviation Disasters. Ken, welcome to the show. Hi, Jeff. Good to see you again. Very cool. Very cool. Well, one of the things that I think is just amazing is uh, that you were there at American Airlines mm. on September 11th, and mm -hmm. we just celebrated an anniversary. Uh, I would love to hear your stories, your memories of that day. Uh, how did you first find out? Hmm. You know, everybody says they remember where they were on September 11th, 2001, right? And like everybody else, I do too. So as the manager of emergency response, we had recently hired a new senior analyst. I'd just been promoted. And so this was my replacement. And we were actually in day one of our two-day family assistance uh, training class. So it was on a Tuesday about 8.30, 8.40. So 40, we started at 8 o'clock, so about 8.40 in the morning. Um, my new senior analyst was up in front of the room, a room addressing about 25, 30 students, and the phone rang in our classroom. And so I said, keep, keep going, and I'll answer the phone. And I go and get the phone, and uh, you need to cancel the class. We've had a plane hit the World Trade Center. And you know, your mind processes a thousand things, of course. And I'm thinking, wing clipped, how did we... You know, did, you know did, did we just loosely touch the structure? You know, how did this happen? They're like, no, the plane was hijacked. It was flown into the building, cancel the class, and get back to operations um, as soon as possible. And wow. so we canceled the class. We got in our cars, and we drove back to our system operation control center and started our, our process of checklists. We have some uh, pictures from the, that uh, horrible day. Uh, what were the next uh, 48 hours like for you? What happened? The... The next 48 hours were, were pretty surreal, as I think everybody was kind of shell-shocked, if you will. I mean, I think we all remember what it felt like. Um, normally, when there's an aircraft accident, the airline deploys its special assistance team and its accident investigation team, or usually wheels up within two or three hours after notification of the event. That didn't happen this time because it was a terrorist event. And before any of our flights could deploy, we had four aircraft that deployed or were sent out that afternoon, Jeff. Um, I think it was around three or four in the afternoon. Um, we were going through our checklist. We were um, obtaining information from our volunteers on who was available. And then we were looking at which city we were going to send people to. Wow. So our flights went to New York. Um, Boston, Washington, and Los Angeles. Well, it seems to me, and I can't, you know, I can't even imagine being in your position, that it, no amount of planning could have prepared uh, an airline for that day. It, it doesn't prepare you for the magnitude of what we experienced. The tasks we did, um, you can be on the ready for. Um, but what's interesting about the plan is, you, you, a plan is a plan is a plan but how well does it flex? So normally what we would do is we would go to people's homes and we would work with them there or at an established family assistance center at the accident location. Well, we had multiple accident locations this time. The, and so that was a challenge for us, but we had those set up, but then families couldn't get there because the air system was shut down. So it's like, all right, well, we can't do that. So what are we gonna do now? Well, we already had established telephone communications with many of the family members. And so a lot of our work wound up being telephonic, mm -hmm. except for those family members that could take the rail or drive to one of our family assistance centers in Boston, Los Angeles, Washington, or, um, or New York. Wow. And you put that story and many others in your book, uh, Resilience. Tell me, why did you decide to write the book? Yeah, you know, I, I decided to write the book. Um, unfortunately, we had, a, we had a very storied past. Um, and fortunately, aviation safety became safe and there weren't accidents, which is a really good thing to have. You don't want, obviously we don't want accidents. But a lot of the folks like me at the airline industry that did this kind of work were starting to retire. 
there weren't accidents, the experience was going away, and a lot of the, uh, I will say tribal knowledge was also going away. Right. So I wrote what I thought would be an interesting book on, here's what it's like to be activated, here's what it's like for the, uh, and to some degree, for the families, and how resilient they are in the aftermath of an accident, so that as safety becomes the pillar, a pillar for flight, if you will, we have real life experiences to look at for people to draw their experience so that they don't make the mistakes we did, but they can do the good things that we did instead. I, I have a question. Um, I, I know in the news business and uh, some to a certain extent in the police business or firefighter mm -hmm. business, you have to kind of put up a shield in order to not mm -hmm. lose your mind. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a compassion fatigue when you've handled so many tragedies in your life? There, Yes, the yes is the short answer. Um, and we had several within our airline that were back to back within anywhere, anywhere from six to eight weeks apart. And we may have just been home for a week or two and then were redeployed again. And all of us had, with the exception of my team, there were four of us and then the rest were volunteers within the company. They all had their regular eight to five jobs. Mm -hmm. um, so that was set aside, they volunteered with permission of their supervisor manager to be able to go and respond and, and do this. Um, but the airline also takes very good care of the responders and the volunteers. So we have critical incident stress debriefs, we have diffusings, access to, to mental health care during and after the response to make sure everybody is okay. They get, uh, have, there's mandatory time off for, you know, so you can decompress and kind of get reacclimated back into your work life and your personal life. One of the things I've really been impressed with, uh, with you, Ken, is your ability to handle the media requests. Uh, so we've got mm -hmm. a little video of you on a local TV station um, not too long ago. Uh, the media will call you. I mean, when something mm -hmm. like this happens, mm -hmm. your phone rings, doesn't mm -hmm. it? It does. And w what I try to do, and it doesn't always happen, but I try to do is to put the human element into the story. Mm -hmm. 99% of the time, Jeff, and I think you know this as a media person, the, the, the emphasis is on the accident investigation. I want everyone to know about, and potentially hundreds of family members that have just lost a loved one and what they're going through and what the airline and others, it's not just the airline, the government and other agencies that are respond, responding, what we're doing to try to help the families in the aftermath of, of such an event. And it, I, it strikes me that um, every single one of these is, is just hits you in the heart. I mean, you're just a, you're a very compassionate person. Um, Thank do, you. Do, do you uh, does it ever get lost on you that you are with families often in, in you know, the, 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 on their worst day? It, no, it's never lost um, on me. And, and it's never lost, I think, on any airline's care team member. Um, it's not something that, I mean, they're volunteers for a reason. They're folks that want to come and help in the aftermath. And first of all, the airline industry, you have to know, is a very close-knit community. And even with 100,000 employees within a major airline, we feel like we're a small family. And most of us know somebody on the plane or work closely with, with somebody that knew somebody that was on the plane. And at the end of the day, that's our, that's our company at the end. And we yes. want to go do what we can to make things better as best we can. Tell us about your consulting business. Uh, you you are hired to do what these days? So today I'm, I'm hired more on the crisis response, uh, kind of the strategic side of things. So in the aftermath of a disaster, airlines have plans. There was legislation that was passed in the United States in 1996 called the Aviation Disaster Family Assistance Act. And it laid out a really good groundwork for not only the airline, but the National Transportation Safety Board, Department of Justice, Department of Health and Human Services, and a, a whole list of other agencies. What I, what I try to do with my clients is to say, yes, the airline is a piece of it, but there can be 20, 30, 40 agencies or more that are gonna respond, and how do you all play nicely in the sandbox together? And so really try to coordinate the response. There's a lot of activity with airlines around the um, headquarters for operations, emergency operations center. Yes. Well, at the end of the day, nobody's gonna write an article about how well that center was staffed. What they're gonna write about is how long did the family member have to wait to dial into you as an airline, and how quickly did you respond face to face with them? So let's talk about what the priorities are for the families. So one of our analysts, for example, we had this organizational chart that had 
you know, the leader at the top and it came all the way down to the team leaders and the structure and the family members. And she flipped it upside down and said, this is not how it works. We all respond to the families. Mm. And so at the top of our, our organizational chart were the families. And then we were supporting underneath in terms of, we looked at it like we were a concierge. What's the ac access to services? What services do we have for you in a collective we in aviation, not just the airline? And here are the services that are available to you that you might not be aware of that can help you through this. We, uh, you were just uh, here talking to my team about uh, perhaps rebranding and, and looking at uh, what you would do with a podcast. You've, you've had a podcast with mm -hmm. us before. Uh, we were toying around with the name Resilience because things that you learned um, from helping families at mm -hmm. their lowest point could help a, a business leader, could help mm -hmm. a company, couldn't it? Mm -hmm. Oh, certainly. Um, there were certain things that I saw in each activation, and there's a saying within in accident investigation and, and certainly now family assistance work, if you've seen one accident, you've seen one accident. They're all different. They're all very nuanced, but there are similar similarities and there are kind of themes and things that reoccur. But one of the things that I saw and I noticed it from the first family I worked with through um, even the volunteers is how resilient they are. Mm. How they can bounce back some bounce back faster yep. some slower but there were things that helped contribute to it and one of those things was ironically and i say ironically because sometimes the truth is hard to hear yes but people can handle the truth and they want to hear the truth so we share with our team members the truth is going to be this is what we're going to say we're yep. not going to speculate but it's how you deliver the message that mm. is important and i think that helps contribute to the resiliency and we can see that in businesses and how employees are talked to. We can see it in our own personal relationships and how we talk with our children and our spouses yes. as to whether or not we can survive any kind of hiccup in the relationship, personal or professional. I think you're really onto something. So I think about people like Mark Zuckerberg, who a year ago is having to testify on Capitol mm -hmm. Hill. Uh, mm -hmm. And he's being grilled by these lawmakers mm -hmm. who really have been waiting for their 15 minutes of fame so they can ask him that zinger question. And he's a publicly held <laughs> company, so stock prices can go you know, plunge based on what he says. Oh, sure. When you sure. talk about resilience and, and being tested, is that kind of what you're it, looking it, at? It's exactly that. And it's being, it's it's not only the test, but it's how well you pass the test, so to mm. speak. You know, are you providing all the information? Are you providing the services? Um, th there, There's a host of things you can do, I'm going to say procedurally, mm -hmm. but it shouldn't come across that way. You know, it's like, do you know all the steps that are available to you? And oftentimes in a crisis, for example, we're not thinking of those steps. And that's where we can come in particularly in aviation disasters, to say, here's some things we can do to help you and get you through those steps. And then how do those morph into just everyday life? And that's what I try to do with my clients. I think that's wonderful. Uh, go ahead and give us your website. We'll put it on the screen. Oh, great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, of course, www.kenjenkinsllc.com. And the book is Resilience. Uh, it's available on Amazon or your local okay. bookstore. Ken, thanks for being a guest on the show. You're welcome, Jeff. Good to see you. And that's it for now. We'll see you next time.